Are you a biased TEFL teacher? Are you holding your students back because of particular bias that you bring with you into the English language classroom? We all want our classrooms to be open places where our students feel welcomed and included. That's a key, I think, to all English language teachers. We, we, we all want that and we all want our students to grow. But the question we need to ask ourselves is whether we're subconsciously holding them back with our bias that we are putting onto them. Let me explain. And I'll do so by showing a couple of examples of how I've been biased in my thinking towards my learners. I'll also give you a couple of tips to how to overcome it as well. Okay, let's start with a bit of um, confirmation bias. You set a piece of work for your class to do. It's a written piece of work. You want them to do something that uh, builds on from what you've been teaching them. So you sit them down and you ask them to write a paragraph, maybe a couple of paragraphs, on a particular theme. The students work individually um, and at the end of the lesson you go to collect in their papers, you ask them to put their names on it, you take them away back to the staff room or back to home and you proceed to mark them as any normal English language teacher would. So here I have um, one piece here, it's from uh, Marco and I note, ah oh, yeah Marco, great, oh, he's really good, he's done very well in, in the past, that's absolutely brilliant. But by doing that, I've actually introduced bias into my marking. How so? Well, I've compared what I've not read yet with my preconceived ideas of what Marco has done in the past. So I'm thinking when I read this piece of work, it's going to be good. And that can influence how I mark it. I may be looking to oh, that's good, or, or that's brilliant, or okay, there's a small slip there. But my attitude towards it is one of positiveness, because I think Marco's a good student, or he's produced good work in the past. Now, imagine that I come to a second piece of work. And let's see, here it is. Yeah, it's from Lucy, and I'm looking at it, and it's a bit shorter, and she had problems with the present perfect last time, and had she done that again, and oh yeah, she still hasn't learned it, and oh. And can you see how, before I've actually read the content in detail, I've got a negative connotation towards it. So I'm actually confirming in my mind what I think about Lucy and her work, and that's a type of confirmation bias. And I found myself doing that. So actually, I've picked up a couple of techniques that have really helped me stop doing that. And I've started blind marking my students' work because it gives a much fairer idea uh, for me of actually what's being produced. The way I do it is this. Uh, if I've got a good number of students in the classroom, I get each student to choose a number from a box and I write down the number next to the student's name and then I put that piece of paper away in the drawer. And instead of writing their name on their work, the students write their number. So now when I come to mark the work, actually I don't see their name, I just see a pile of work and I go through and I mark it much more evenly in that way. And it's a really helpful tip, a good way of overcoming any potential bias that I might bring in about marking my students' work. Okay, so that's one area, but there's other areas of bias that I can bring in as well. Let's look at a second one. It's one that I like to think of as being like a preferential bias, something that I've noticed has happened to me um, as I've been going through my teaching career and something I've really had to try to stop doing. Now, if we've done a group work session or, or work in small groups and I bring my class back into plenary and I want to ask some concept or comprehension questions to make sure that they've understood what they've been reading or what they've been doing, um, then quite often I found myself saying, right, okay, I don't want this long gap of silence if I ask a particular person, so let me ask somebody who I know is quite good, who probably will get the answer right and get us off to a good start. So I might go, 
OK, Marco, can you tell me? And I would pick on Marco first, and Marco would come back usually with a good answer. But can you see how if I do that over time, the risk of the potential uh, bias is going to creep in? If I keep going to Marco or other more able students to answer the first questions, then two things are going to happen. The first one is that some of the other students will perhaps think that Marco's better than they are, and that's why the teacher is choosing Marco, because he usually gets the answers right. And that can lead to them seeing me, the teacher, as favouring Marco in some way. But it can also have the impact of them feeling less in themselves. They might feel more inferior because they're not being asked that first question. They're having to wait. So, my suggestion here is when you think about the questions you're going to ask your students, those concept and comprehension questions that you write, perhaps think who you're going to ask them to. It might well be that you've got um, a less able student that wouldn't be able to answer the kind of question you would ask Marco, but they might be able to answer uh, a slightly easier question. Why not start with that easier question and that student first? And in that way, it'll lead to a fairer distribution of how you engage with your learners in the classroom. So, being aware of potential bias in our classrooms is important. Now, the purpose of this isn't to make you feel guilty. Um, we're, I'm just talking about things that I've found in myself that I've had to correct from my own teaching. But I think we all should be conscious about what we bring into the classroom. It could be cultural bias. It could be preferential bias. It could be things that confirm what we think we know. But ideally, we want to be fair and we want to give all of our learners the opportunity to progress. Um, at whatever speed is best for them. So thinking around these things as we come to plan our lessons is important. I hope you find that helpful. We've got lots more tips. It, these come from our Level 5 uh, professional TESOL course at Global English. We'll be recording more videos on them as well. Uh, so that whole area of ethics in TEFL is an important one. Do subscribe to pick up more tips uh, from our YouTube channel and really hope that you enjoy this and have fun with your teaching.